Hey, Barrett. Happy Easter, everybody. Um, welcome back to the show. It's so good to be back here to see everybody again. I am uh, more than excited to be back with you, but especially because of my guest tonight. Um, my guest tonight is a legendary... I had to write all this stuff down, Rick. He is a singer, songwriter, guitarist, uh, teacher, cartoonist, columnist, author. Um, and of course, um, he is a member of the multi-award winning, multi-platinum multi selling band Triumph. Please welcome back to the show, Canadian legend, Rick Emmett. Welcome back, Rick. Uh, thank you, Kelly. It's nice to be here. And it's good to see you and see you healthy and happy and shining face. Good. good. Yeah, it's, it's great. I feel great. Um, it's been a great weekend. I've got company down for the weekend. So we've been, uh, you know, it's it's my longtime bandmate, actually, that I was on the road with all 20 some years with and so we and his beautiful wife and so we've just been cooking and eating i don't think i i think i ate more this weekend than i normally eat in a week but, <laughs> but i got i got a monster on the go <laughs> to combat turkey brain so <laughs> all right Fair so enough. i'm just curious rick so what did easter look like in the emmett household this year we had everybody over so uh my four uh, kids and uh, all of their spouses and um, all of the grandkids. So we had, nice. the, you know, the adults table with nine and the kids table with four. There's a baby <laughs> on the way. So with that there, we're going to be uh, grand grandchild number five. Gonna That's going to happen within a, probably about a week. Oh, so, wow. So she was uh, she was pretty big <laughs> and, yeah. before the turkey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and she has dietary restrictions. So the, the, there was a lot of different food, which was kind of interesting. And um, we do an, an Easter egg hunt. So that's what oh. happens around the. So on uh, the night before, Grandpa, which is me, is going around and hiding eggs and then making oh. clues that go inside the eggs that have, you know, the little candies in them, but also like little plastic eggs. And the, the so they all get to play sort of Sherlock Holmes. Now, the little ones, they got to get mom and dad to read the clues and help them. Right. But nevertheless, it sort of generates the enthusiasm of, hey, we're going on an Easter egg hunt. And the older one, like my, the eldest one is, uh, he's about 11 now. And um, so his, we try to make a little bit more like Sherlock Holmes. You know, right. he's got, like Adam goes, there's a space with 14 handles. Two are not the same size. You know, this kind of <laughs> stuff has got to, yeah. I try to make it like it fun, you fun, know, fun. I try to be creative with these things so that it's so it's a lot of fun. And then, of course, the parents are following them around with their cameras, cameras. <laughs> so that they get videos that we can all share later on WhatsApp. You know, so what a cool pop pop you are to put that yeah, much effort in. <laughs> you try, right? Yeah, you try. No, it's all about creating memories, and it sounds like you made some good ones. I I learned how to make a turkey this weekend. <laughs> What a sad commentary, Rick, for somebody my age. I had this company coming. I bought the turkey, and I'm, and then it dawns me. I don't have a clue how to really make a turkey. Do you put water in it? What temperature? I don't know how to make gravy from scratch. I can make you a five-course Greek dinner. Not a clue. How. So anyway, my company made the whole dinner, but but I watched and learned. I watched and learned. My daughter, Shannon, she's a, uh, you know, she's a pretty great cook. And she learned a lot of stuff from her mom, Um she puts like almost like whole oranges and lemons and stuff inside oh, wow. the turkeys. Yeah, because it makes them incredibly moist and juicy. Um, but then you have all this crap <laughs> <laughs> to deal with after. And it smells yeah, like heaven. Inside, and nobody wants to eat that stuff. You go, where's the stuffing? <laughs> Where's yeah. the stuff with all the bread? And the, <laughs> the carbs. What is this, fruit? Yeah. <laughs> Right on. Good stuff. Well, you look, you look well, Rick. You look great. We were talking a bit about the show. Um, and of course, you have just finished a round of chemotherapy for prostate cancer. And I know a lot of the viewers want to know how you're, how you're doing. Are you cancer free? How are you feeling? Yeah, it wasn't chemo. It was radiation. Okay. It was very focused because I only had, you know, one tumor in, in my prostate and uh, it went well. The, the old, like, uh, you know, I got a little bit of imposter syndrome when you're going every day and you're in that clinic and you're seeing folks that are in a lot worse, you know, dire straits, you know, um, than, than, than I was. So, you know, I think I had a fairly good attitude about it all. And um, I was, but it was just an inconvenience, you know, For and sure. I was thinking like, I don't belong here, you know, like I, I'm not that sick, you know, I don't have that much of a problem. 
Um, but I mean, having said that, you know, um, I have some other issues we're talking about. I was letting you know about my uh, arthritis that's you know been getting a little worse as I get older. So uh, I had to stop taking uh, drugs for the arthritis while I was doing the radiation. And then once the radiation was over, I got to start the drugs again for the arthritis. Right. And I'm not sure that those drugs are doing a great job. So I've, got to, <laughs> I've still got you know stuff I've got to straighten out with with doctors and specialists, and I have those appointments all lined up and. I'm trying to be a good boy, but you know, every now and then, <laughs> with a with an Easter dinner, it's nice to have a glass of wine. You know, well, of course, of course, because you probably couldn't have that during that whole treatment. No, no, I had to be a good boy. And I mean, yeah. back in the day, in the Triumph days, I was not a drinker. I would have maybe one mm -hmm. beer every, you know, nine weeks. You know, I was hardly. A, that's it, rare. That's a yeah, it rarity. Didn't, it yeah. didn't interest me at all. But, um, you know, the older you get, the more you go, well, you know, uh, I've already <laughs> I've, uh, reached the top of the mountain and now I'm on the downhill side. <laughs> I wouldn't mind grabbing a drink every now and then just for some fun, you know. Absolutely. Kick yeah. back and have some vino and <laughs> enjoy yeah. some life. Well, you look great. And we were, and the, you know, the one thing, because um, as most people know, I've had my own health issues this year. And uh, the one thing it has done, and we were discussing this right before the show, Rick, is it sure gives you a whole new perspective on how precious life is and how precious your health is and how, and, you know, your bucket list, I don't know if you can say this, but for me, my bucket list has shifted. Like what, what used to be really important to me is kind of shifted to, you know, the people I love and, and my show and, and my health and that sort of thing, rather than say material things. Has, yeah. has that, has that happened for you, Rick, where you're, where you just see things slightly differently? Um, yes and no. Uh, the yes part would be, of course, that um, you start to realize that um, the road is short. <laughs> like the the future ahead of me is uh, shorter than the past that was be that's behind me. But that whole Zen thing about wanting to be in this moment, right. you know, that Buddhist kind of. Uh, why am I worrying about tomorrow? Why am I so regretting so much about the past? Like that, it really reinforced that. And the reason I say no is because I feel like um, I, I'm one of the lucky ones in life. You know, early on, I had a lot of success. I was able to uh, satisfy a lot of the material things. I mean, Look at my set. I have a lot of guitars. Yeah, you got a you got a few guitars there yeah. in the old collection, Rick. <laughs> yeah. So, so I was able to indulge myself a bunch of things that I really that were important to me, and then that led me to realize that all I really ever want to do is be creative. I want to write. I want to play. Those are the things I want to do. And I had the right wife that allowed me to indulge that. Uh, you know. I had a lifestyle that I was able to build that kind of worked around that. And even though there were certain things where, you know, I would get not necessarily off track, but, you know, there would be a sidetrack where, oh, now I'm teaching in a, in a college course. And right. so there's all of those kinds of duties and the discipline of that. But in a way, it was a, a creative thing that I enjoyed, too. And I was it was all about music. And I could talk about music forever, you know, so that there were certain things that I was able to do early in life that. Now, I'm still consistent about those. And they're probably the things that, I mean, you know, you and I were exchanging emails before and you were saying, hey, can you read something from your poetry book? Can you read something from your book, blah, blah, blah. Th this whole thing about writing, like it was something that I kind of always wanted to do and didn't have the time for it. Right. So now that I'm retired, now I have the time for it. it but it's just creativity. It's the same thing as everything <clears throat> I was always doing. So I'm just really being me and being consistent. Right. You yeah. know, Rick, one thing, and, and I actually, I have this in my notes because I, there's just so much to remember, but I, I was thinking about that and I thought, because you're a right brain thinker, as am I, and I tend, I call right brain thinkers creatives. Um, I don't do well, and I think you're the same, well, I don't do well with left brain sort of analytical, methodical, I just don't do well with it. And I think when you are a creative as you are, you have that ability to have different talents just ooze out of different pores and different genres and veins where you can... You know, you can write a song, you can write a book, you can teach. <clears throat> yeah, I think, I mean, you've read my book. So <laughs> you know that, yes. I sure uh, have. <laughs> I suffer from this thing, uh, and it's called cross-dominance. So when you're talking left brain, right brain, 
I actually have fairly equal bits of both. I, you're right to say that I'm right brained because I do I do favor that and I, and and I'm left handed except I'm not left handed when it comes to fine motor control. When I want to write, I pick up a pen in my right hand. When I play, pick up a fork, I eat with with my right hand. So this cross dominance it made me. A, the perfect candidate to play guitar. Right. My strong hand is on the fretboard and my fine motor control hand is picking the strings. So there's a lot of guitar players. It's disproportionate. <laughs> Let me tell your viewers and listeners this, you know, in the population, only 10% of people are left-handed. Right. Uh, of those 10%, only 1% are cross dominant. So, I'm one in 100 in terms of, you know, just the way that society is. Um, but uh, my life became something where I was able to be taking advantage of it all the time. Now, but to your point about uh, organization and stuff, I can be pretty disciplined. And in fact, like when I was in Triumph, I probably drove Gil and Mike crazy because <laughs> I, was, I was the one that wanted to rehearse a lot. And I was the one like... I had this kind of discipline that was like, no, this is the, like, this is the way that we do art. You know, it must be a discipline thing. I want form and I want structure. And I, you know, and as a writer, I'm a very organized kind of, uh, my work ethic is very organized. So that's not, that's pretty left side. You it's definitely have traits of both because I'm a writer. That's my day job. I write for a magazine and they give me a topic and I can pump out 1500 words like that, but give me yeah. a math equation or yeah. balancing checkbooks or remember numbers. I'm a complete idiot. Like I am so one way. Yeah, well, but but here's the thing, you, you know, my dad had been, I mean, he'd worked in payroll at CP all of his life. And at a certain point in my life, my dad said he'd, uh, when my grandfather had passed away, uh, my dad inherited the house. Then there was a tenant living in the house already and uh, paying the uh, like a second mortgage kind of thing. Or maybe my grandfather had taken back, uh, held the first mortgage. I can't remember. Anyway, <laughs> my dad says, well, Rick, you're going to have to learn how to, you know, uh, work the numbers here. You figure out how much he should be paying every month as he's paying off the principal. Right. So that you know the difference between, you know, principal and interest and and the you know the balance of sewing and and so i thought oh my god this is way too much responsibility <laughs> yeah. you know like, i'm not so good at this but my dad kind of forced me no you're gonna learn how to do this so how fortunate for you to have that sort of guidance right i didn't have that <laughs> yeah well there you go yeah so we're we definitely are here to talk about the book and by the way thank you for the copy uh, that you said, I mean, it's excellent work. And this is, most people know this, this is actually your second book. Um, uh, your book, Reinvention Poems, came out, of course, in, in 2021. And I, I just, I was reading this, and you can clarify if this is true or not. As far as the writing goes, um, I understand it was your son that first suggested that you write a book back in 2010 or something like that, and around the dinner table I read. Yeah, well, that, you know, it, it makes for a good story. It does. I'm, nothing <laughs> I'm talking about it. <laughs> yeah, I'm nothing if I'm not a storyteller. Um, no, but yeah. I, well, it used to be a kind of a standard running joke that at, we'd be around the dinner table and something would happen and I would launch into something and my son would say, oh, dad, why don't you just write a book? You know, you, you should write a book. And the other kids would go, yeah, yeah, you should write a book. You know, But, I mean, I had a grade nine English teacher tell me, you know, you're going to be a writer someday. Uh, well, and, you have sorry. a gift. And this yeah. Is and not just your teachers, but I, I heard like, your, you know, your your wife, your teachers, your Eldon, your physiotherapist told you you were a storyteller. Yeah. <laughs> See, I've read the book. <laughs> yes. And, uh, and, and so I guess my question to you is like, did that pave the way for you or did you always, was that something you kind of always knew or do you think songwriting and playing a triumph sort of, uh, groomed you to be a writer? Or do you think that's just something you were born with as a as a high functioning right brain person? Uh, no, I mean, the the thing that started it was probably as a kid being a, an avid reader, and I think reading was probably the thing that 
sort of led me towards this state of mind, which was that creativity was this infinite, great, really cool thing. I thought that the stories that I could make up in my head were often better than the stories I was reading in you know, magazines or books or whatever. And I would watch movies and sometimes be disappointed. Right. Think, you know, that story could have been better, you know. Right. And What's the whole truth is, it's the whole truth is stranger than fiction. Yeah. But it, that, I, you know? Ego is a part of it. I, I think, you know, obviously you got to have some ego to be thinking my story is better than his. <laughs> you know, like, um, so there's that a little bit. But, um, and then the thing became, as my life sort of became more complicated and now I'm in a rock band, <clears throat> the writing of songs started to take up so much time and energy that there was really no time to be writing books. Right. Uh, and uh, I did write a novel. Uh, well, I started one and I got deep into it. And um, I realized I was staying up until three and four in the morning when I would have to be up the next day to be in the school and teaching at like 10 a.m. and I was going, oh, this is crazy, you know, right. I'm, I'm burning myself out. So I threw the book in the garbage. Like I, I, I you know. Just wrote it off. off. <laughs> yeah, deleted it out of the computer. Because writing a novel, that scares me a little bit. It's, it's more like uh, that might be something where I would be biting off something I couldn't chew. Whereas songs, poems, a memoir, I already had so much of it, you know, because of emails that I'd written on my members forum and all like I already had uh, so much material to, to work with uh, stories that I'd written, uh, you know, lesson plans, uh, themes about songwriting and, and uh, stuff that I'd done in guitar clinics and seminars, blah, blah, blah. Just so much stuff that I realized, right. well, my memoir, my problem is going to be how do I keep it under 300 pages? <laughs> Right. Well, yeah. and I think the other thing too, Rick, is I think timing is everything when it comes to something, you know, as personal as a memoir, because had you tried to write it back in the triumph days, you would, there was so much more living to do to write about. Yes. So exactly. it almost didn't make, wouldn't make sense to me to write a memoir back then because you'd have to write another one for all the rest of the adventures that you've had. Yeah. But of course the, you know, when uh, I mean, and it's not like I don't do research and read other people's memoirs and stuff. For sure. Like, for sure. Hey, this guy's got three of them. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> he really likes his life. <laughs> yeah. The thing is, if it sells really well, then your, your publisher is coming back to you and saying, Hey, do another one. Go follow yeah. up. Let's write. Yeah. Hey, David Niven, let's write another one. <laughs> you know, like, and some guys, of course, like, you know, I say that because I really like David Niven's. His was full of fantastic anecdotes and stories. You know, some guys have just so many great stories that they can just keep telling them, you know. Um, I think I exhausted most of mine. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get into talking about uh, uh, Lay It on the Line. I, I actually love the, the total because it's Lay It on the Line, a backstage pass to rock star adventure, conflict, and triumph. That's catchy. But first, I just have to give a huge shout out to my show sponsors, Writers and Rockers Coffee Company. Uh, this tonight's featured coffee is Trooper Raise a Little Hell. So you can check Writers and Rockers Coffee Company out, uh, www.writersandrockerscoffeecompany.com for all your favorite rock star coffee blends, mugs, t-shirts, hoodies. Uh, and so thanks them for being a huge part of the show. And we're going to give away some free tickets so I'm going to get that started, Rick, so people have time to answer. Okay. So uh, it's Central Live has partnered up once again with Good Times Comedy Club Lethbridge. So huge shout out to uh, James Bariza. Um, and so we're going to ask a skill testing question. Rick's going to ask it. And the winner will receive some free tickets. Um, it's kind of something more for the local viewers because you have to be here to use the tickets. But uh, okay, Rick's okay. going to ask the question. Yes, the skill testing question is. I'm, I'm giving you a drum roll, Rick Emmett. Thank you. All right. When I was in high school, I got a nickname. And then when I was in Triumph, it was my nickname all the way through. And now there's only a few people on the planet Earth that call me this. Gilmore, Mike Levine, and my wife. What <laughs> is that nickname? There you go. That's the, Although I hear when when your wife's angry with you, she calls you Richard. I know. No, that's not. <laughs> I know I'm in big trouble when I get the formal the formal name. Yeah. You hear Richard and it's like, stop, drop, and roll. <laughs> what? <laughs> right on. Uh -oh. so, Richard. Uh -oh. <laughs> what did I do? 
Oh, okay, so I we're gonna get to lay it on the line, but first, because I also love your first book, Reinvention Poems. And one of my favorite poems in that book is a poem about the great legendary Gord Downey. And yeah. it's to me, it's what I what I call hauntingly beautiful. So I'm gonna let you read that now, Rick, and then we'll move on to lay it on the line. Okay, so this poem is called Game Changer. And uh, yes, in memory of Gord Downey. All right, here we go. <clears throat> In the summer of 2016, Gord Downey went supernova. The shield of the dominion cracked open. The sleeping giant awoke in thermals of heat and light. From beer league hosers in their flannel to undergrads getting baked on blunts at college lakes, he offered a book of common verse. Then, when fate began to force his hand, he anted up and raised the stakes, a moving target of courage, defying the grip of harsh mortality. He strutted, he sang, this is how it's done. He raged into the face of death, hearts breaking, the landscape altered by thought, word, and deed. He was us, and we were his. Yes. Oh, I no poet of ours ever dreamed as big, no rock star class clown ever danced a better jig. Dream catcher, game changer, pet binder, spellbinder. The raven swooped low across his path and stuck a trickster's feather in his cap. Never before had we seen his kind. And it's hard to see how these things could ever be the same old, same old again. Beautiful. I I was reading that and I it almost brought me to tears. And I actually I feel a little bit misty right now hearing it like from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Thank uh, you. What what did see your obviously clearly you were a fan? What is what was your inspiration to write that for Gord? Uh well, there's a couple of them. I mean, I opened for the hip once in Ottawa at an outdoor thing, and I'd never seen them live. And so I walked out into the crowd, and it's funny, you know, it's like I could stand in a crowd in Ottawa and no one really knew who I was. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Perfect. when I'm up on stage, yes, they could. But, but yes. And then I saw this guy that was just so charismatic. So you couldn't take your eyes off him. Right. He was like, you know, uh, this Canadian version of a Mick Jagger kind of personality, so much larger than life. And, and yet, you know, so Canadian, so poetic, so all of those kinds of things. So, um, and then I was playing a gig in Saskatoon, uh, and it was one of these outdoor summer things, bands all day long, blah, blah, blah. And uh, we went in, I'd finished my set, and we went into the bar, and we were sitting in the bar, and the hip was playing the last night of the tour in Kingston, right. of that tour that, you know, I'm referencing in that poem. And it was just all these people from all these rock bands, you know, like the guys playing in Carol Pope's band and the people playing, I can't remember the other bands that were on yeah. the bill, but you know, like Canadian kind of rock bands and everybody was just sitting there watching Gord and the hip, you know, doing this thing in Kingston. Cause it was, you know, the final so, show, right? Yeah. Dinner time in, in, in Saskatchewan. So everybody's having a couple of drinks, you know, yeah. in the bar. And it was, it was very moving. It was powerful. It was palpable. You could feel like I watched it on TV. Actually, I think I watched it in a lounge, but on, on a big screen and you could even through the screen, you could feel, you know, the love and the anxiety, like almost an anxiety sort of, and such a sadness, but yet such a celebration. And I'm, I'm wondering if you have a respect for Gord Downey in that you're both storytellers. Well, like, certainly to that. And the, the fact that he was a poet was one of the things that made me go, okay, well, I want to, I want to try my hand at that because uh, he's, you know, he was a very good one and he was a very schooled one. Uh, he had a deep understanding of Canadian poetry and, you know, I, I'd been a bit <clears throat> of a flipperty gibbet kind of, you know, <laughs> a bit of a what? <laughs> a bit of a what now? <laughs> spent a lot of my teenage <laughs> years, you know, chasing guitar players and, and, yeah. you know, it wasn't like I was reading Earl Burney, you know, I, right. when I was 
doing interviews for reinvention a woman from out west was and she said have you ever heard of lorna crozier and i said no i, I i've never heard of she goes, oh well <laughs> you've got some reading to do you've got some homework and i went yes and i you know a little embarrassed that i don't have the depth and the chops that you know other f folks have but it doesn't stop me from you know like somehow or other my ego goes well give it a shot anyways you know yeah but you do though rick you do like i've read both books and and you know here's uh, just to, before i forget to mention this something i found interesting is um in the reinvention poems you actually did a poem called angel and you reference adam saul in that yeah. poem and i read because I, I was reading reviews on it and you actually got a review from adam soul on that book and, and this is what he had to say so uh he, yep look out he said um rick emmett is someone who has always sought out new modes of expression new kinds of music but it's clear that rick has found an inspiring vocal register in verse and words those who have followed his career will recognize his wit and irreverence but might notice a new tone of introspection emerging in his pages. His fans everywhere will be delighted. Oh God! Oh, is that the first <laughs> you're hearing of it? Oh shucks! <laughs> no, no, I, I, I did know that. I mean, he writes for ECW Press, so right, same you know, as you, yeah. Yeah, we share the same editor, so you know, uh, I, I do uh, admire his work, and he'd written a book that was a big sort of kick in the butt for me, which was, uh, this is how a poem moves. And, and and it was it's literally like he teaches uh, poetry at okay, uh, so this was kind of like a almost like a textbook of th this is what a poem should do, you know. It it, it 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 don't worry about meaning, worry about how a poem the, the motion that a poem has, the way that it moves, flows, and yeah, how it works, you know. Um, much more important than whether or not somebody's going to get the meaning of it. And that was very, very inspirational for me. I, I really loved it. Yeah. Right. And so what is, what does it feel like? Well, one of my questions was, what, was, what does it feel like to hear, you know, those kind of accolades from another author that you respect, obviously? Uh, it's a lovely thing, but you know, I, fairly early on in my life. And I think part of this is colored by the fact that, uh, okay, where will I start with this one? Well, when I played sports, I was five foot seven, you know, on a good day. <laughs> it's taller than me. <laughs> yeah. Well, but in sports, as, as you start getting to elite levels, the guys are getting bigger and stronger and you're this pipsqueak, you know, yeah, uh, I get you. that people kind of, um, they would take me for granted or they would, you know, uh, underestimate me. Right. And I and I didn't mind that, you know. I, I it made me compete harder. So then I got in a rock band, and uh, eventually Triumph uh, was a band that critics didn't really like us very much. You know, we had audience members that liked what we were doing, and of course. bands that figured out what we were about. But in a superficial way, we were an easy band for people to dismiss, and I can see why but it was superficial it was not great so then you get a chip on your shoulder you know about okay well th that's how it's going to be and you would <laughs> we put on a record it was going platinum and then there, all the reviewers and all of the daily newspapers in canada would absolutely destroy us there would be these horrible reviews that would just be like mean spirited you know because really? they, because they could yeah and so I started to realize you can't believe the really, really great ones. You can't believe the really, really bad ones. The truth is probably somewhere in between. And right. you have to just be able to rely on yourself to make your own. Like sometimes you can read a horrible review and you can go, you know what? There's a sliver of truth there. And I will, and I'll, I'll absorb that and I'll take it with me as I move forward. But then sometimes there's ones that where they're praising you for everything and you go, yeah, I'm not that great. You know, That's I'm over the top, top right? <laughs> you know, so thank you. But, you know, I've still got a lot of work to do. I've still got a lot of things that I have. To, and so, you know, I measure myself against people like Joni Mitchell and go, yeah. <laughs> keeps you humble. <laughs> yeah, keeps you humble. Exactly. I love it. <laughs> Yeah, you know, like, and I mean, Joni Mitchell wrote songs as a 23-year-old woman that 
they 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 start to show even more expression now when she's 80 years old and she sings it and you go oh my god you know? and they're standing the test of time like her exactly. music it's, it's it's timeless classic exactly so classic music, know, right? those are things that should keep you fairly humble and i like to believe that i recognize those kinds of things and go yeah yeah okay right and you know what i agree with you rick because i the whole thing about what the critics say about stuff I mean, I've never had, I'm not in a position where critics write anything about me, but I really think it's important to dismiss it because what I was just thinking of now, it's like when you're searching, you know, you're scrolling for a movie on Netflix or Prime or whatever, and then you see one you like, but it's got a really crappy Rotten Tomatoes score. Yeah. I never listen to those because chances are those are the ones I end up really enjoying. And it just, that parallel just kind of popped into my head when you were, well, you know, right. when you were speaking just now, but lay it on the line, my friend. Wow. Okay, I, I have a question for you first, and then we're, and we have a winner, and you're going to be surprised by who it is. Okay. <laughs> Actually, why don't we do that now, and then we can, sure. we can launch into book talk. Yeah. So, so the winner is a very good friend of mine. He's been a guest on the show. He plays with Sonic X, and his name is Joseph Combo. Well, <laughs> what are the odds, eh, Rick? <laughs> what is Joe Combo doing watching this? What, what? Because he watches the show, and they've been on the show a couple times. Sonic X is an incredible band, and they're buddies of mine. And oh, all right, we love the Great. we love Joseph Com Combo, and I was going to say Joey Greco and the, and the entire band and Sill, and they're great guys. And and I've had conversations with Joseph where where he's brought up that he used to play with Triumph. Yeah, well, the, the <laughs> Joe was our guy. Like he, he, you know, he was the like. And he was pals in the early days. He was um, managed by the guy that ended up becoming like the vice president of Live Nation, Joey Scaleri. So he probably knows who that is. Oh, you, you, you're damn straight. He knows. Damn straight. Oh, by the way, the nickname and Stephanie Blackmore, congratulations, because you're tied. Um, they both came in. I have a timer here. So I see the comments the minute they come in. And you guys are both tied by answering at 620. I had Stephanie Blackmore and uh, Joseph Combo got the name Rocket. Nice. Good for you. Well done. Good job, guys. Joseph, it's great to see you in the house. There is, what is with the Bobo thing? Because there are a ton of comments coming in. And there's a couple of people that said Bobo as a guest. What is that about? Does that make sense to you? Bobo? <laughs> you don't look like a Bobo. More of a Rocket than a Bobo. Well, I have no I'm idea. A, I'm, <laughs> there's two of them. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Oh, uh, it's great to see you, Maggie Hall. Uh, there are so many comments. Uh, Rox Hunter, great to see you, buddy. He's um, he's just saying great to see you guys both. Gary Jones, hey, Kelly and Rick, continued good health to you both. Bless you. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, you know what? I just thought of this. Bobo, my <laughs> grandkids call me Bubba. So maybe that's what they were thinking. Maybe because, Maggie's psychic. <laughs> well, when they were little babies, I thought, I'm going to pick a nickname, you know, instead of being called Grandpa. or Yeah, no know, one wants to be called that. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, and I thought, what's one of the first things that a baby might say? And then I went, Bubba. If I teach them to say Bubba, then they're going to be like, Bubba. Which you is know? cute, which is so much so more that's acceptable that's, than Grandpa. Called, maybe that's... <laughs> Maybe that's where Bobo came from. Either. Maybe. Right. Thanks, everybody that guessed, though. Um, yeah, Bobo, I, I don't know about that one. But, yeah, good to see get, oh, Amy, Stephanie Blackmore is there. Jimmy Burkhardt, who was also a guest on the show, is in the house. Hi, Jimmy. Great to see you. Uh, Phil Days has a good comment. He says, uh, Rick and Steve Stevens are the ultimate well-rounded guitar players. They could play a shoebox if it had strings. Respect. <laughs> there you go thanks phil phil's a musician himself so he knows what he's talking about uh and nancy inch is saying life's greatest storyteller is rick emmett oh nancy. everett yeah. mercer you yeah. may know ever yeah do you know her oh yeah nancy oh. runs the triumph thing on facebook and and she's all like the the triumph documentary she, she might be on screen more than me they go hey here's a good looking you know tall blonde with long hair let's get her on there so you know she's got a lot of screen time yeah. everybody's gonna be looking up nancy inch's profile on facebook <laughs> see this hot girl uh everett mercer oh yeah yeah Rick, great to see you buddy he says all the best wishes in life rick take good care kelly thank you everett yeah there i'm probably not going to get to all them guys so uh, Rhonda Rowland uh, Vocals Gang. Hi, sweetheart. It's good to see you. I got to meet her out at a music event last summer. Thanks to both of you for this great show. 
Uh, Rob Castro Giovanni says, if I was a writer for a newspaper in that time and I didn't like your band, which I do, I'd like to think that I'd be a bit more respectful with my review. People could be so cruel. So in reference to what you were just sharing. Good point, Rob. Yeah, you know, I mean, there's no point in crying over all of that spilt milk. I and mean, you know, yeah, I, I did have a thought in my head as we were walking up to get our, you know, Walk of Fame <laughs> award. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like, well, I think we maybe proved some people wrong. Right? Like, in the end, I would sit back and count my money and laugh. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really, I really would. Uh, Joseph's just saying, I love you, Rick. Uh, Michelle Truman from Toronto's in the house. Uh, Michelle's a good friend of mine. She just says, right on, Rick and Kel. Um, and one more, I got a question from UCU's Mackie, who's a good friend of the show here. He says, Rick, what is the one guitar that you will never let go of? Well, yeah, I, I get asked this a lot. And um, the one that I have right now is this one. Right, I'll get it here. Hey, can we see this one here? Uh, can you... This is... Uh, Listen to that. It's like a Telecaster, but it's got a Gibson kind of bridge and scale length. So it's kind of like a Les Paul, but... And, and it's it's all rounded and smooth. I had a guy named Garen DeCassian loosen guitars in uh, Oakville. And he, he uh, I sort of uh, had a guy named uh, Mike Smith who does these pickups, MJS pickups. And so this is the one. If the house was on fire and I could only grab one, this, <laughs> this is the one I would grab. But, what? Yeah, I mean, you can see back here, there's... I was just going to say, if, if you can move aside there, Rick, if you don't mind, every check out Rick's guitar collection. <laughs> yeah, some Les Pauls here that I would be very unhappy to lose, and there's a, a Godin Supreme there that is one of my favorite guitars. And I also have this. I'm just going to show this one quick. This is I had it, this custom made out of parts uh, by MJT in the United States. And I, the, my, one of my favorite guitar players is Zed Bickert, jazz legend, Canadian jazz legend. And I thought Bickert's guitar, when he passed away, it would never come on the market because he, he had kids. And I thought, well, they, you know, they won't. But it did come on the market, by the way. But I'd already had this made. And it says Bickert right up on the, I have it there on the. Special as I. Uh, yeah, I made it. I had a sticker made and everything so that this would be very similar to his guitar in a lot of ways. But. His guitar came on the market, but it sold in one day for, I think, in excess of 30000 U.S. <laughs> so I went, well, I wouldn't have bought that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> in retrospect. Yeah. Oh, hey, hey, Mark Chichkin is in the house. So Mark Chichkin, of course, is from Helix. He's a former at such a live guest as well, and he's a really good friend of mine. Mark is one of the sweetest guys I've ever met on the planet. He says, hi, Kelly. Hello, Rick. Much love for your work, Rick. I saw Blinding Light show in Detroit. My first experience at seeing lasers live and what a better way than with your band love triumph. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. Right on. Thanks, Mark. Um, okay. I, mean, I think I, Oh, Chris Chalice. Hey, uh, we were just talking about Rick on the weekend at the eighties weekend, miss him and his playing. Glad to see him looking so young. Ooh. Oh, <laughs> okay. Well, we like that guy. That's we, yeah. That's Chris is a, Chris is a very talented drummer. Yeah. You, told me a story where uh, I, I stole the laser virginity of a guy from Helix. <laughs> Put that in your next book. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> I'm gonna write an email after the show to yourself, Rick. Oh, so it, my first question about the book is this. I thought this might be interesting because I, I read some prefaces and I was going to read them to people, but I thought it might be more interesting to ask you this question. In your words, if you were writing the preface, preface, some people say, of Lay It on the Line, how would you describe it? Uh, well, I did write the preface that's in there. You know, uh, literally the first chapter was kind of like, okay. I once heard a guy talk about making speeches, and he said, you know, this is what you should do. It, tell people what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. <laughs> that's how to make a great speech. I thought, well, if I'm going to write a book, I guess what I'll do is start by saying, this is what I'm going to tell you, you know. And um, I think that what I realized through the living of my life was that creativity was the thing I was going to hang my hat on. That right. was my thing. And so I, uh, that's my story. My story is about creativity. And um, 
even when I was uh, playing a guitar, it, it was about telling a story. Uh, when I was learning about music, it was only so that I could use the music in order to tell stories, you know? So that storyteller thing was a, a big part of uh, my genetic kind of code. So that was what the book was going to be about. How did I become that kind of guy? Where did I start? You know, what things happened to me? What stories? Now, I should tell you this too, Cal. Um, uh, there were things that uh, my fans would write emails to me on the forum on my website and ask me any question that they wanted, right. any time, whatever that could be possibly they, they want to know, and I would answer it. And so at one point I said to my uh, webmistress, Adrian Duncan, shout out to Adrian. Um, hey, Adrian, can you, all the emails that I've written back, the answers, I don't even need the questions. I only need the answers that I've written. Can you compile it all into one file and send it to me? Right. It was well over 5,000 pages. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So I went, okay, <clears throat> there's any question that anybody might have, my, my job is to edit, you know. So, and I used to tell songwriters, by the way, it shouldn't be called songwriting. It should be called song rewriting because right. <laughs> what you spend most of your time doing, you know, <laughs> editing and rewriting. So, yeah, that, that's, and, that's how I would, that would be my preface. And, and that's a good one because I think, I think you made a valid point there, Rick, because as a writer, I know one thing that, and you're talking about rewriting and editing, you can stare at your computer till blood droplets form on your forehead, read if at some point you do you not and i imagine with the book you finally just have to say okay it's good walk away it's done yeah because or, you could drive yourself nuts here's the thing uh that's why there's editors and that's why they get paid you know right. like you, you you give it to somebody else so you get perspective but um i once uh, ian terry was on the faculty at um humber college and he would talk this in the recording program and stuff and, and uh I really liked Ian a lot. And he won all kinds of Junos and stuff for everything. And he'd worked on April Wine albums and, you know, you name it. I think he'd been on some Rush sessions up at uh, Moran Heights and stuff. Ian said, you know, a record is never finished. It, you only have to deliver it. <laughs> like, You're right, yeah. There comes a point where you just have to deliver it, but it'll never be finished. And I believe that's true. I believe you could keep rewriting stuff and oh. changing it and, you know, but at a certain point, you go, uh, am I it's done. Walk away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, the one of the things that I love, love, love about this book, Rick, is that like so many memoirs that I've read, I've read a lot of musicians' memoirs, and a lot of times it's just about the music, and which is interesting to most of the fans. But I think a lot of times people want to know more than just, you know, what happened on the road and were there drugs and women and all that sort of stuff. But the one thing I love about this book is that it's not just about music. You know, um, like a lot of memoirs tend to be, you don't have to be a musician to enjoy it. Just it's just a fan, right? And it's it's personal thoughts and experiences as a human, not just a musician. Yeah, I think because I, I was a teacher for such a long period of time, the whole thing of, okay, what if you're not really a teacher, you're more of a psychiatrist? What if you're not really a psychiatrist, you're more of a philosopher? What, but all of those kinds of things, you know, roles that you have to play when you're trying to shape people's minds and spirits and you're supposed to be, you know, being careful with it. And, and uh, I think that judicious kind of uh, weighing of, of stuff about trying to balance things, I thought well, in the memoir, I wanted to make sure that I was expressing those kinds of feelings towards readers, that they would be given the same kind of respect that I would give anybody that was, you know, sitting through a lecture of mine or right. know, figure out what a song of mine meant or like, you know, um, I have a respect for readers and, and I want to speak straight to them. The truth is a really important thing to me in my process, you know? So, yeah. um, yeah, I, that, that is going to show up in different ways in a book for sure. Right. And it, well, then to me, I like it's real and it's candid, but it's diverse in that, you know, chapters cover everything from, you know, your days of triumph, the music biz in general, personal experiences and choices and perspectives, songwriting and guitar, guitar, guitar. That's actually yeah. the name of one of the chapters, guitar, guitar, guitar. That's and, it. Uh, 
yeah, and I personally, this was, you know, t- different things are going to strand out for different people, but I really love the personal story of why you spell, how you came to spell your name Rick with a K. <laughs> Instead of the traditional way, I thought that was a cute, like those little anecdotes are what I, I personally, I like to read about if, when I'm a fan of somebody's. Yeah, I, I don't want to tell that story now because I don't want to use up precious time. That's okay. You buy the book. <laughs> 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 that they can find out just exactly what Kelly was just talking about. How I lost <laughs> it out of my name. There you go. You got it. That's a good segue, it's, Rick. You got to read way, the book. <laughs> when you said guitar, 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 uh, this is what I thought about. I should uh, plant this seed for you now. I've already finished my next book. I've actually finished my next two books. I have another book of poetry that Michael Holmes at ECW Press is sitting on. It's not going to be my next book. It's going to come out later on in 2025. But early in 2025, in February, a book is going to come out, and it's called 10 Telecaster Tales. And it's a book, but it's a record because I recorded 10 pieces. I had my good friend Blair Packham come here in this studio and help me. He engineered and I recorded 10 guitar pieces on that guitar that I just demonstrated a little bit for you. And so those 10 pieces, then I wrote a book about the writing of the music, uh, what it's all about, why did we record it the way we did. And so, because I'd read a couple of uh, Jeff Tweedy's books, the guy from Wilco, and I thought, I have a a cool little book. So, And we're going to have like a collector's edition of it with a really cool leather cover and blah, blah, blah. And a CD slipped into it. And then there'll be just a regular one that you can buy, you know, Amazon or Indigo or wherever. And uh, that'll you'll have um, like a, a, an Internet address where you can go and download it from Bandcamp. So oh. we're, we're going to have downloads for, you know, for the folks that don't want to spend the big money. But for the folks <laughs> that want the autographed, you know, crazy little collector's edition version of it, we're going to have this thing. So I've written a book and it's about guitar, guitar, guitar. <laughs> Oh, that what are the odds that I brought that up? That's yeah. awesome. Well, you'll have to come back and tell us about that. I will. But yeah, absolutely. You're welcome here anytime. Uh, Rob Beg, I just I wanted to. Hey, Rob. Uh, he says I love Rick Emmett. I bought his first record when I was 13, and that Sunburst famous. Great job, guys. 1976. He's saying Rob Beg, incidentally, uh, is the bass player for A Night of Bowie, and they are my guests next week. So great to see him in the house. Um, Mark Chichkin is just raving about how much he loves you hilarious thinks you're hilarious <laughs> so um i'm gonna I, and i know that you are super tired today because you traveled and traveled and traveled and it's later where you are so um are we done are we going to put the book aside i think anything else you want to know i think we've given them a really good taste of it you wanted me to read a little something from it do you want me to do that the why don't we do that now you go ahead okay. if you're ready for it that would that would be lovely sure uh shall i i can read <laughs> There's two little excerpts that I have, okay? So the first one is going to be about um, storytelling. And then I'm going to read just the the way that I end the book, okay? Perfect. This first little chunk is called, it's about storytelling. It's got a a, a subtitle that sort of says storytelling. We're constantly surrounded by stories. People place faith in stories and draw strength from them. Everything in human social and cultural activity has a story, a narrative, a construct. Politics is a story. Finance is a story. Wars, religion, sports are all stories within stories. Music is no different. Our brains are wired for stories. Why? Because we want to figure things out. We want to believe there will be a happy ending, a purpose, and that it's not just random chaos, that we matter and can make a difference. Maybe an earworm sticks with you and you can't get rid of it until you figured out its story. What is it trying to tell you? Maybe it makes even more sense if you flip it around. What is your story that you can divine from the song that's sticking with you? The stories we live in can be the ones we choose. Maybe we get this short little dance on a blue ball circling the sun and all we ever do is make believe, trying to make some sense of it. I'll easily admit that my perspective on music maybe self-delusional in the way that some people believe in angels and demons or in the way that a child accepts the story of a tooth fairy. Music makes sense to me. Not all music, but lots of it. Self-help in my life was deciding which stories I would invest myself in. 
creativity makes sense. My guitars and my notebooks are my life companions. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> I love it. I love that. And that's the other thing that I really noticed, you know, in your, in, well, more so in the new book, of course, laid on the line, is that there's a there's such a huge level of humor and and playfulness. You know, there's serious moments, and there's uh, and that in, in the excerpt you just read had all of the above. All yeah, in, well, you know, all in one reading, and that's what makes it so interesting to read because you really get a sense of who you are as a human. Thank you. I I think you know. So I'm well a, done. Yeah. Entertainer, right? I, I'm a performer, and so the the whole idea of writing you could go so deep that you lose that level of being an entertainer or a performer. But right. when I write, I, I do try to have that, as you say, sense of humor. Like you need something to leaven it when it gets heavy. Yeah. And, but if it's all superficial candy, then where's the meat? <laughs> you know, yeah. there's, there's going to be a balance in there. Yeah. Where's the, where's the Easter turkey there, Kelly? Where is it? <laughs> That I just learned to make. I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> That's right. It's gotta be some meat. Okay, so shall I read the little the last little bit at the end of the book? Please do. Okay. Um, here we go. So this is the last uh, four paragraphs of the book. Okay, how it okay. ends. Okay. Okay. And by the way, when I wrote this, I did not write it as an ending. I this was something that was in the book, and when Michael Holmes was doing the first edits. He wrote me back a note and said, when I got to the end, he said, this is how your book should end. And I went, really? Oh, <laughs> okay. Well, you know, and then I, I took it and I stuck it at the end and then I moved everything around so that everything would be in front of it. And this is the way, and it was Michael Holmes call and it was a good call. And this is why it's good to have an editor sometimes. For sure. They, they got perspective. I would have never thought of this as an ending. Right. But, he thought it was the best one. So here we go. And I was just going to quickly say the end paragraph and the opening paragraph are the two most important ones. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think. You're, you're you're echoing Keith Moon from The Who. He used to say, <laughs> you know. the this I meant to do that. <laughs> yeah, Keith goes, this is, how the best, this is the best way to do a set list. Start with a bang and end with a bang. And all the rest of the stuff in the, in the, doesn't, in the middle doesn't matter. <laughs> doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. Let's. Uh, here we go. This is how I ended my book. Right. It's often hard to reduce life to simplicity, because it can get so complicated and messy. But the simple transaction of love is always there, always available to us. Gifts pay back, the making, the taking, the giving and getting. The dynamic balance is about love. I loved the creativity, the music, and I loved being able to play to offer it, give it, share it. Folks would say thank you and I would say you're welcome. It's my pleasure because the music, the work, the creativity truly was mostly my very great pleasure. Love resonated out, then came echoing back with such amplification that I could sense its infinite power. That was always humbling, always made me feel so grateful. I still can't be sure that I found the right words to say it. And maybe that's why music is often the best choice for me, because it can work without words or with a few select poetic words combined with the prosody of a melody and the colored landscape of some chord changes. Music, in its emergence, creates the circle that is unbroken, the gifts that keep on giving. It's a beautiful thing, such a beautiful, lovely thing. Life still feels like it's too damn short with its infinite number of ideas out there, waiting to be discovered and learned. Back in 94, my lyrics for The Longing spoke of always feeling like I was running out of time, physical skills, vocal range, memory, chops of all manner. As time wore on, I had to be more selective, but was never obliged to be less imaginative or less creative. Could I do more, say more with less, could I distill better than I ever had? On good days, I'd look in the mirror and say, yeah, you can get to work. <laughs> I like that because you're not expecting, you're not expecting, excuse me, that last, you know, get to work because it, but what an eloquent, eloquent way to end your book. I, I love it. It's work I, stuff, right? 
I mean, uh, pretty straightforward, really, but um, it took me 300 pages to get there. <laughs> right. But it's just a it's just a really big, powerful exclamation mark of an ending for a book. So, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Well done. And I before I forget, I wanted to mention one of the reasons why I wanted to, and you were on the show when when Reinforcement Poems came out. But I wanted to bring it up again because it's equally as good a book. And also I was I was looking around Amazon today and um, you can get both books if you go to Amazon. And if you're a true fan, you should definitely have both books. Um, you can get them both literally for under 40 bucks. And I was pretty impressed with that because I've spent more than that on on one memoir before easily. So, you know, that that's, you know, make it affordable to the people. And, and so I just wanted to let the people know that. And um, on behalf of the fans, I'm going to let you go here, Rick, because it's it's been some and I know you've had a long day traveling and and yeah. Uh, yeah, so I just I can't thank you enough and thank everybody for your questions and comments. And it's so great to see everyone again. So on behalf of the fans, Rick, I just want to thank you for your contributions to the music industry and now the liter literary world. Um, continuing to share your ongoing adventures and projects with us. We're proud that you're Canadian because that means you're ours. Um, <laughs> and I kind of like what you said about Gord, you know, we are yours, you are, our, you are ours, we're yours. And, and uh, you know, good stuff. So and you are more than welcome to come. Anytime you have a new book, come back and see us. And so. Thanks, Kelly. God bless continued health. And we'll talk to you soon. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs> thanks so much, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, thanks again to Writers and Rockers Coffee Club, uh, Coffee Company, pardon me, and to James Bariza for Good Times Comedy Club for graciously donating the free tickets. Uh, tune in next week with Syl Thompson, Rob Begg, and Kyle Radomski, who are members of A Night of Bowie, the definitive Bowie experience, uh, considered to be the most credible and realistic Bowie experience in North America. And I'm a huge Bowie fan. Can't wait for that one. Thanks again, Rick. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Stay safe, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning in. Have a great week, and we'll see you next Sunday at 7.